oftentimes we skirt the biblical doctrines that relate to sin and judgment and major on the doctrines that relate to joy and peace and love and happiness. And I can certainly understand that because it's much more fun to talk about love, joy, and peace than it is sin and judgment. But the same book that we rely on so heavily to assure our hearts that God is merciful, gracious, forgiving, and love is the same book that talks with equal intensity and frequency that God is angry and that every man one day will give an account unto God for the words, deeds, and thoughts of this life. If the Bible says one thing, it says man is responsible. We're not going to be able to blame the evil one. We're not going to be able to blame our own fallen nature. We're not going to be able to blame the glitter of the world system. We are responsible for our acts. We live in a godless, unfair world. If there is not a judgment day coming, God is an unfair God. For this life is anything but fair. But God's going to set it straight one day. David struggled with that in Psalm 73 as he saw the prosperity of the wicked and said, I can't handle this. One day, it's going to be set right. And you know what amazes me as a theologian more than anything else, I guess, is that Jesus is the one that talks about judgment more than any other. It is only in the words of Jesus that an eternal hell is spoken of except one time in the book of James where it says our tongues are set on fire by hell. Every other time that word appears, the, the Greek word behind our English hell, which is Gehenna, not Hades, Gehenna. Every time that appears, Jesus Christ talks about it. He is the one that wanted men to clearly understand whosoever can come unto me. And he's the one that wanted us to clearly understand whosoever doesn't come unto him goes somewhere else. It is with that in mind that I'd like for us to turn to Matthew 25. I dealt with the three parables last week that come between two major pillars of understanding the end time events. In Matthew 24, it talks about the second coming. Then there are a series of parables to help us understand that truth, and then a major passage on judgment in Matthew 25. And in between those two pillars are these series of uh, 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 illustrative materials. Now, I really believe that what Jesus is doing is going back to an earlier teaching and amplifying something he said. If you'll look back quickly to Matthew 16, 27, I want to read that to you, for he made a brief allusion to judgment there and now he's going to amplify it. Notice Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's splendor with his angels, and then he will pay back to everyone in accordance with what he has done. Now, that's not a very full passage, but the one we have before us is going to talk about what that's going to be like. Now, I want to say a couple more preliminary remarks, if I could. Number one, this passage describes Jesus Christ the way the Jews thought he was coming the first time. They expecting him, expected him on the white charger, the military conqueror to set, uh, Rome, uh, set uh, Jerusalem up for all the world to flow to. They expected him to come as he, we expect him to come again. And the reason there was such confusion is the suffering servant of Isaiah completely caught them by surprise. Also, the deity of the Messiah completely caught them by surprise. And they were not expecting either one of those. Jesus is coming again the way the Jewish people expected him the first time. You talk about marvelous splendor and majesty. Friends, next time we'd see Jesus, he's not going to be riding on the colt of a donkey in one uh, linen tunic. Woo, glory will be all about him when we see him again. Now, the second thing I want to say 
about this passage is this is not a definitive passage. We do not learn everything about judgment from this passage. This is more a dramatic presentation instead of a detailed description. Uh, the passage that Ed read you out of Revelation 20, 11 through 15, gives a balance to this passage. If all we had is this passage, you could argue that there is a judgment of works coming based on what men do to other men. But when you bring in Revelation 20, 11 through 15, you realize that it is our profession of faith in Christ, which is written in the Lamb's book of life, which begins to issue in the way we live, and the way we live verifies, confirms, and solidifies the decision we made one time in Christ. So this is a passage on the necessity, the importance of Christian living. With that in mind, let's get to the to end of the text. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his splendor, now I want to say a word about the Son of Man. Many of you are familiar with that term. This is a term that Jesus chose for himself. Whenever they would say he wanted to say something about the Messiah, he wouldn't say Messiah. He would not say Son of David. He very seldom would even let someone say Son of God. But he would call himself the Son of Man. Now, the term Son of Man is an Old Testament term. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel primarily, when God wants to speak to the prophet, he'll say, Son of Man, stand on your feet. I will speak with you. And therefore, it's obvious that it means human being. And so the term son of man has the obvious connotation of humanity. But in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13, a human being comes before the throne of heaven, before the ancient of days. Now, it's a human being, but he comes riding on the clouds of heaven. No one rides on the clouds of heaven but God. The clouds are the transportation of deity. The very fact that the human being comes on the clouds of heaven brings to the term son of man the connotation not only of humanity but of deity. That is a perfect term for Jesus. Because the central truth about Jesus is he is fully man and he is fully God. And this term was not used by rabbinical or interbiblical Judaism to talk about the wild messianic developments that occurred between the death of Malachi and the beginning of Matthew. And so there were no false militaristic nationalistic concepts caught up in this phrase. Not only is Daniel 7.13 important about the deity of this term, but in this passage right here, he is coming with the Father's splendor and with the holy angels. Friends, no human being comes with the glory of God and the angels of heaven unless they're deity. So confirmed again is the aspect of the Son of Man being fully God as well as fully man. That's very important, I think. And all the angels with him. There are several passages you might want to look at about the angels coming in judgment. You might want to see Matthew 8, 38, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7. And for an Old Testament passage about the angels with God uh, surrounding him is Daniel 7, verse 10. Now, I often wonder why the angels were coming. Well, I think we get some of the idea from right here. The angels are coming to separate the, the uh, um, sheep from the goats. To put it in another parable, they're coming to separate the wheat from the tares. And the angels are going to do that work of gathering and separating on the last day. And they're going to be going to the four corners of the earth to do that. Notice it says, He came to take His seat on the splendid throne. This, of course, is God's throne. Jesus sitting there is a symbol of His power and majesty before God. Usually it says, on God's right hand in many other passages. You heard about the little girl that came from Sunday school and said, Mother, did you know Jesus can't move? God can't move? And Mother said, God can't move? What do you mean? She said, well, Jesus is sitting on his right hand. <laughs> In biblical metaphors, that is a way of speaking of the majesty, preeminence, power, and authority of the place of the Son. Matter of fact, in your outline, in your background study number D, I've given you some of that. There are many passages that affirm the certainty of judgment. There are many passages that affirm that God the Father will do the judgment. Romans 14.2, 1 Peter 1.17. But many other passages affirm that the Son, all judgments been given over to the Son. John 5.22 and 27, Matthew 16.27, Acts 10.42, 2 Corinthians 5.10, 2 Timothy 4.1. We get the balance from other two other passages where it said that God is going to judge the world through Christ. That'd be Acts 17.31, Romans 2.16. Friends, 
the reality of judgment is as real as the reality of heaven. And you really can't have one without the other. Now, and all the nations will be gathered before him. Notice it doesn't say Israel and the nations, it says all the nations. Israel's a part of this. It shows the universality of the judgment of God. It also shows about the universal spread of the gospel, by the way. Boy, when I think of all the nations gathered before him, boy, my mind runs like, a, like an arrow to a target to Revelation chapter 5, where in that great day every kindred, every tongue, every nationality, every possible division among mankind is going to be in that great choir, Randy, that sings worthy is the Lamb on that last day. All the nations are going to be there. And he will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates his sheep and goats. Now, in Palestine, sheep and goats grade together in the day and are separated at night to sleep together. Now, if you want to see an Old Testament background of this, in Ezekiel 34, the leaders of Israel that pulled Israel's heart away from the Lord are called false shepherds. And God is called the true shepherd that's going to judge the false shepherds, and bring the true sheep back to himself. That's why Jesus, I think, is so significant. He's called the shepherd in John 10 because God's called the shepherd in Ezekiel 34. And so here we have the shepherd separating the sheep and the goats. By the way, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you realize there are only two categories of mankind. Only two. It's real black and white on this day. There's no gray areas. There's no ambiguity here. There's two groups. You're either going to be with the group known as the sheep are you going to be with the group known as the goats? Only two groups. Now, everybody's going to be in one of two groups. What you've done with Jesus Christ and how you've lived his life is going to be the determination of which group you're in. He put the sheep on his right hand, place of honor, authority, and the goats on his left, and the king will say, now he's entitled one place a shepherd, now he's entitled a king. Several times in the Bible, God the Father is called king. You might want to see Deuteronomy. 10, 17, and a beautiful passage in 1 Timothy 6, 15. Jesus is called the King of kings and Lords of Lords several times in the book of the Revelation, Revelation 17, 14, and 19, 16. Here we have the fully ascended glory of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, wrapped in the glory of preexistent splendor, coming again, sitting on a throne, judging mankind. And the king will say to those who are right, Come, you who are blessed. Now, this is a special verbal form. It's a perfect passive participle. They've been blessed in the past. They remain blessed. But you know what? Listen here. They didn't know how blessed they were until the king told them. <laughs> they didn't know they were doing all these good things. They didn't recognize that by serving other believers, they were serving Christ. And when Jesus finally tells them, what they've been doing that's so wonderful, they said, oh, really? They're surprised. State of blessedness and don't really realize it. Notice it says, take possession. This is an aorist imperative. It's a once and for all command. The word here in Greek is really the term inherit. And of course, because of Romans chapter 8, we know that we are the children of God. We've been adopted and therefore, we're going to inherit with our elder brother, Jesus the Christ. Inherit the kingdom prepared from you before the creation of the world. I tell you, the kingdom of God is an eternal and central concept in the preaching of Jesus. We don't talk about much in the church. But if you'll just read the Gospels, Jesus talked about the kingdom of God all the time, kingdom of heaven in Matthew. It was the first subject of his first sermon, the subject of his last sermon. Every parable almost begins, the kingdom of heaven is likened to. It is the reign of God in men's hearts now that issues in Christ-like action that will one day be consummated in the reign of God over all creation. When Jesus prayed in the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, he was praying for the fullness of the kingdom of God to come. Notice this little phrase, prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Oh, boy. Another perfect passive participle. You ought to see Ephesians 1, 4, and 11 for a great, great truth that before you and I were created, before God spoke the worlds into existence, several things that happened. You want to get a real blessing? 
You ought to look up in your reference Bible of concordance, this little phrase, before the foundation of the world. There are five or six things God did before the foundation of the world. One of them is that Jesus Christ was willing to come and die for us. The other thing is, before the foundation of the world, your name and my name was written in the Lamb's book of life. Hallelujah. Before creation. Here we have that the kingdom was prepared for us, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God was prepared for us before physical creation was even prepared. God knows his own and has planned long beforehand for their provision, care, and Christ-likeness before the foundation of the world. Verse 35, Jesus enters a series of six or seven things, depending how you divide it. He was hungry, he was in prison, he was thirsty, he was naked, and on and on. And these who were saved say, um, and the king will answer them, I solemnly say to you, verse 40, every time you did a good deed to one of the most insignificant brothers of mine, you did a good deed to me. Well, isn't that surprising? It surprised those people. It surprised those who knew him but did not realize that every act in Jesus' name done, listen to me now, listen to me, done for another Christian, because it says these brothers of mine, this is not a passage on universal good deeds. This is not a passage on feeding the world's hungry. This is not a passage on helping lost people. This is a passage on the mutual love and respect between the people of God in Jesus' name, these insignificant brothers of mine. Now, I want to give you a few passages. I want you to write them down because I want you to see the close connection between the least Christian in your estimation, whoever that is, the least, the most insignificant, the most radical, the most unloveling, whatever you say, the most the insignificant Christian. When you love them and minister to them and help them, you are doing it to no one less than Jesus Christ, and he counts it as ministry to himself. Let me give you a few verses. You might want to see Matthew 10, 40. You might want to see 1 Corinthians 8, 12. And then three times in the book of Acts, when Paul gives his testimony, on the road to Damascus, the bright light shone from heaven, and Paul was knocked to the ground with the bright light. Paul was on his way to persecute the church in Damascus as he had persecuted the church in Jerusalem, and we believe he even had many of them killed as well as put in prison and confiscated their property. And the light shone from heaven, and Paul says, Sir, who is it? And Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Oh, there is a close identification between the people of God and the king of kings and one act of ministry to each other is an act of ministry to Jesus himself I remember the story I, I heard one time about Francis of Assisi a wealthy middle class merchant was riding out of the, his city of Europe which he lived in his beautiful clothes on his fine horse and as he left the city he saw a leper leprosy in that day was a terrifying disease you had to scream unclean, just like in the biblical record, and stay away from people and wear certain clothes and cry out. And it was a, it was a, a, a dreaded disease like the plague. Francis saw a leper. His heart was filled with compassion. He got off his horse and put his expensive robe around that leper's naked shoulders and hugged that leper. That night, Francis had a dream. And he dreamed he was in that Revelation 4 and 5 throne room of God. And Jesus was sitting on his marvelous throne wearing Francis' robe. I wonder if your life is characterized by ministry to the insignificant believer. Acts 9, 4, Acts 22, 7, Acts 26, 14. Then he will say to those on his left, Be gone from me, you who are now cursed. I think the ultimate problem with hell is not the physical torment. And friends, I won't talk just a minute about physical torment because, you know, I, have, I get no pleasure in dangling people over the fire. But I am a biblical 
creature, and fire is in there more than you want to imagine. But first, before I get to the fire, I want to say this. In my estimation, the worst part of eternal judgment is that we will not have fellowship with God. I don't care where Jesus is, I just want to be with him. I don't care about streets of gold, gates of pearl, I just want to be where Jesus is, and that's heaven. And where Jesus is not, that's hell. And this idea of separation is a recurrent theme throughout the Bible. You might want to see Matthew 7, 23. You might want to see Luke 13, 27, where Jesus says, even to those who profess to know him, who did not have a personal relationship, I never knew you. Depart from me. Oh, there's no worse words in all the universe than depart from me. No, no worse words. Now, I want to get this deal about uh, everlasting fire. That's been a real problem to many people. Now, I want you to know that it's everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, first of all, the devil and his angels are not corporal beings. They are created beings, but they're spiritual beings. Now, we're dealing with a metaphor. I'm going to say that to you. We're dealing with a figure of speech. We're dealing with a literary tool to communicate the horrors of hell. But the literary tools that are used so often by Jesus point toward the reality and probably far beyond because I'm not sure words can convey. Now, there is a real play here between the aspects of eternal judgment. In verse 30, if you'll look at your Bible, it calls this eternal separation outer, utter darkness. Darkness. Darkness as dark as the plague of Egypt. Darkness as dark the day that Jesus died. Darkness. And yet, in this passage, in verse 41, it talks about fire. Now, to us, fire and darkness are incompatible metaphors. And yet, they both speak of the realities. Grinding one's teeth, gnashing and wailing are metaphors of excruciating agony and pain and torment and horror. Now, let me list you a number of times the Bible talks about eternal separation being a fiery ordeal. This is, this is no uh, a pleasant thing to present. But as we present the realities of the love of God from the Bible, we must present the entire picture. Isaiah 33, 14. Isaiah 66, 24. Matthew 3, 10 and 12. Matthew 5, 22. Matthew 7, 19. Matthew 13, verses 40, 42. And 50. Matthew 18, 8 and 9. Jude, verse 7. Revelation 14, 10. 19, 20. Chapter 20, verses 10 and 14. And chapter 21, 8. I think if the eternal word of God mentions fire that often, we need to take seriously what lostness is really about. I believe the reason that most people don't do more personal witnessing is most modern Christians believe that hell is a myth and separation is a lark and somehow everybody will finally make it. Now, you may want to believe that, but the book says wide is the way that leads to destruction and many there are who follow that road, but narrow is the way that leads to life and few there are that follow that road. We need to realize. Now, we go through the whole thing again with those who are the goats. And they say, we didn't know it was you. Look at verse 45. He will answer, I solemnly say, this is the Hebrew word, amen, that comes into Greek is amen. It's transliterated into English as amen. Originally, the word meant to be firm, to be sure-footed. We use it in the sense of I agree with that truth. Right on would be pretty close. Jesus says it whenever he wants to make a solemn statement. Amen to you. Every, every time you fail to do a good deed to one of the most insignificant people, you fail to do a good deed to me. I want to tell you the reality of the Bible is there are not only sins of commission, but even more significant on Judgment Day are sins of omission. When your heart told you to act and you refused, when your heart beat with compassion and you refused, when you feel the tug of the Spirit of God to, 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 to do something for someone in love and you refused, we'll give an account on that day. Now in verse 46, 
The same word used to describe heaven is used to describe hell. If hell's not eternal, neither is heaven. Now, the term here means age. I know there's many interpretations of age, that maybe an age will come to an end. If the age comes to an end, heaven will come to an end. For the same term is used to eternal punishment and to eternal life. You might want to see Daniel 12, 2, the same truth expressed in Hebrew in the Old Testament. Some to everlasting life, some to everlasting separation. God help us. There's a day coming. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say to you as strong as I can say it without getting emotional. Maybe a good walk to the graveyards of Lubbock, Texas to see the row after row of people's names when they lived and when they died and to realize that one day every one of them will come out of the grave and every one of them will stand before God and there's going to be a line through mankind and that line is going to be what have they done with the person of Jesus Christ and how has it affected their daily life and God help us the reason many the reason many are going to be with the goats is because we have never cared enough to make ourselves emotionally vulnerable to them to tell them the good news about Jesus the Christ that came to die in their place and that whosoever will receive him by faith can have eternal life with the glories of heaven and be a child of God. Lord, I do not relish speaking about hell. But if it motivates us to love people more, then maybe it's helpful. God, I pray that the realities of this eternal, eternal, eternal thing will help us see the marvelousness of your love and provision in Christ and will motivate us to be the kind of people you have us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.